marriage is deeply intimate and is more binding than parental relationship and filial affection. Marriage unites the body, unites the spirit, unites the soul. You see, every part of you is involved in marriage. Your body, your soul, your spirit. Marriage is premise on the flame of pure love. And that pure love warms each other up in marriage and to produce sexual purity, sexual satisfaction. That is, it is love on the basis of love. That's how you marry. Somebody said, I married her, although I don't love her. That shouldn't be. If you are not with that man, you feel his absence. When you are not with that woman, you feel her absence. That is what marriage is. Why you are not missing the presence of your husband? You say they stay apart for one month, two months, three months, six months, and they are happy. What kind of happiness is that? It's a great mystery. That is, it's a miracle. It's something beyond human understanding. It is beyond human calculation. It is beyond what you use your brain to sort out. That is why we say God alone is the perfect matchmaker. Precept for marriage that we can learn from Matthew in the words of the Lord Jesus Christ Matthew 19 look at verse 4 and he answered and said unto them have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female I call that the gender the gender is clear male and female number two the goal the first is the gender, male and female. Now they go. What's the goal of marriage? Look at verse 5. Matthew 19, verse 5. And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother. Marriage is to make you leave your father and mother at the age, the time in, in your age. And then, and shall cleave to his wife. The purpose, the goal, and they too shall be one flesh. That someone you two will be one flesh with. That's the goal of marriage. Then, number three, the guy, in the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 19. The guy, look at verse 6, verse 6. Wherefore, there are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together? That's the guy, that's the principle, that's the law here. There is a guy, and this guy's our action. Whatever God has joined together, let no man, by any idea, put asunder let no court put asunder let no individual put asunder let no institution separate them that's the guy and as we keep to god's instruction of marriage we will have peace in life peace in our families in jesus name let no one for any reason forbid anyone from marriage why then do we marry therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. We marry because we are made to marry. We marry because we are to abstain from fornication. We marry to recognize life helpmate. We marry to achieve, realize bigger goal. We marry to yield, to live and cleave. I pray. What God says is good for you, you will not reject it in Jesus' name. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, before we land off. Genesis 2, 18 says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that a man should be alone. God said it's not good. For you to be lonely, for you to be single and lonely, for you to be struggling all alone. Now, let's say, for example, you have been married before and your wife died, and you still have the desire to be married. Why not? You can just having a companion around you is good enough reason to be married. You don't need to carry this burden all alone. You don't need to do it alone. You need to be married. It is not good for a man, a matured man. It is not good for a man, a responsible man. It's not good for a man to be alone. Turn it the other way. It's not good for a woman to be alone. A woman who desire a partner. A woman who knows that her body is active and willing to have a partner. It is not good for a woman to be alone. Now, why are some people decided not to be married when, even when they know that they are made or meant to marry? Because the feelings in their flesh can tell them that. The desires of their heart can tell them that. The realities around their lives can tell them that. 
the personal struggles they have can tell them that and yet they are not married you're not meant to live as a single person all your life except you have special calling to do so but generally we are meant to be married a man is meant to have a woman a woman is meant to have a man and that is the will of god I will make him and help meet for him. I pray that the man that God has made for you, you will connect. The woman that God has made for you, you will connect. In your life, there will not be another disappointment. Now, it's good to be married, but if you are single at the moment, you can be happy. You can be single and be fulfilled. You can be single and be satisfied. You can be single and be all that God wants you to be. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Being single is not a curse. Let no one look down on single men and single ladies. And particularly for those that are married. Because you are married, don't look down the people that are not married. Let no parent mount pressure, undue pressure on the single. And let no church or church leaders, let no religious leader relegate any member of the church just because of their single status. Let no person for any reason act in any way to make you feel as if you are superior to the single. You are married, you are not superior to the single. They are not married doesn't mean you should look down on them or relegate them or act as if I'm better than you. You are not. That you married before someone does not make you better or older than that person. Because I'm not married, I should be sad, I should be crying, not at all. He was single, he was happy. Adam still went forward despite being lonely. He didn't even show loneliness. He, didn't even exp he wasn't the one that even asked God for a wife. God just thought so and God knew so. He was busy, though not married. He was happy, though single. When the Lord joined a man and a woman together and makes out of them marriage, God did not intend that anyone will be a third party in such marriage that is why he said let no man let no one let nothing put asunder when we say third party in marriage that may be a person who is coming between you and your husband it may be your father and your or your mother that you are giving so much attention to your father and that distracts you from your focus on your husband. That your mother has become a stumbling block in your relationship with your husband. That and that person has become a third person. It may be your brother or sister. Do you have a younger brother or an elder brother? A younger sister or an elder sister? Any of your siblings who now wants to get all your time, all your attention, and you have little or no time left for your husband or for your wife or the counsel of your brother or sister or mother or father has become superior to the idea of your husband or wife. Those persons have become third party in your marriage. Do you have a neighbor who you are so close to and that neighbor is now who you confide in, not your husband? not your wife that has become a third party in your marriage do you have colleagues or your children colleagues in the office and these colleagues in the office you are so intimate with them your secretary your manager your senior colleague your youngest colleague a female colleague a male colleague and that person is so intimate with you that even things that is reserved for your husband you discuss and share with that man things that are reserved for your wife you discuss and share with that woman that person that colleague has become a third party in your marriage third parties are not just persons third parties could be an, an object when you have an object that takes your attention is it the television is it your phone when you have an object that once you see that object all your concentration is on that thing is it the football game a program and once you are on football match, 
your wife cannot, for any reason, get your attention. Even when she tries to play along and watch the ball with, with football match with you, just to pick interest in it, just to get your attention, you still shut her up. You still say, no attention here. We know that the woman should try to show interest in, in what you like. But we are saying that when you shut her up, even when she's trying to come along with you, that it's only you and your program. It's only you and your music. It's only you and your football. It's only you and your entertainment, your movie. Now, that becomes third party in your family. It may be an idea. Somebody counsel you. And that cancer had become, had taken the supreme place in your heart. And that cancer out there, and that idea planted in you, has taken the concentration, has taken away your care for your husband, for your wife. That idea has become a third party. It may be a job. You have a job in a place, and now they have posted you to another city. And you have been in that city for one week, one month, one year. You don't care to look back. You don't say, let's post my wife there too. You don't make any arrangement. That job that has separated you from your wife, from your husband for so long a time, and no concern, and maybe you are even thinking of doing something else with someone there. That has become a third party in your marriage. It may be a duty, a religious duty religious responsibility in the church. I'm a pastor. And because I'm a pastor, my wife is a pastor missus. They are posted her to that location. They are posted you to this other location. And you have no more attention for each other. That assignment in the church has driven away, dried up the commitment, the concern. You usually go together before. You rather move together before. But now, because the church needs workers, because the church work must be done, your concern, your commitment, your caring, you're going together has been caught to zero level in your family. Listen to me. That church assignment is not superior to your family. God made the marriage institution before he instituted the church. And so let no service come before your spouse. Let no service in church, no service in the office, no service in the society come before your husband and your wife, even to the detriment of the family. That assignment, that religious duty or whatever duty or assignment may be, becomes therefore a third party in your marriage. And it may be the internet. The internet, you are so glued to your Facebook, so glued to your Instagram, you are so glued to your tutor, you are so glued to your messenger, you are so glued to the chat and the counseling you are having online. And one, even when your wife needs your attention, you shut her up because you are chatting with somebody. You shut her up because you are watching something on online. That is what we are saying. When your attachment to the internet, anything you do on the internet, either for good or for evil, that cuts you up from your husband, from your wife, and that continuously, that has become a third party in marriage. Look at that verse again. Matthew chapter 19, in verse 6. What therefore, the thing God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Let no one put asunder. Let nothing put asunder. And maybe your pastor, the, the counseling that you are getting from your pastor, you always want to see him all the time. You must meet the pastor all the time. And pastor, you must cancel that woman all the time. And the husband is not comfortable with it. And the husband is not happy about it. And the husband is already complaining about it. Can you need to, you, can you stop that? Because pastor, you have become third party in that marriage. You want the woman to tell you every secret of their family. You want the man to tell you every secret of their family. Mm, that's what we're saying. That pastor or pastor missus had become third party party in the marriage.